something up ahead, water falling like a song. An everlasting stream, no river carries me home. Let it flow, let it
hoping you are having a great morning this morning. It is a gorgeous day out. The Lord is in this place. Amen. He is in this place. Amen. Now we're going to talk about it outside sometimes. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Just a couple words of announcements. Um, you'll find our regular weekly announcements in a chair near you. There is a nice little lovely sheet of paper so you can read whatever you can't understand coming out of my mouth. And you will find on this table back here a treasure chest. If you choose to worship by giving tithes and offerings this morning, we invite you to place those in that treasure chest. You will also find outside the treasure chest some green envelopes if you would like to, to contribute to the building fund as we prepare to build a gym and, and uh, do some renovations in here and some other work around the church. We invite you to, uh, to go ahead and to contribute to that as well. If you want to do specifically that, use the green envelopes. Uh, you are welcome to include it in your other check as long as you label it and they know, can look at it in the office and tell where it's going. Um, I invite you to stick around today if you're able after uh, small groups for um, 11 o'clock service. We have baptism this morning. We have as well a called conference. Uh, we are voting on a minister to senior adults and um, affirming our, our interns for the summer. And so we invite you to uh, come and be a part of that some of the business stuff of the church, we invite you as well to come and be a part of our summer project. Thank you. I'm Carolyn Matthews, and I'm here on behalf of the committee who is working on our home mission project this year. Many of you know that for years we built a home in Kentucky, uh, near Williamsburg, Kentucky. Our, our uh, mission has transitioned, and we now uh, are involved in the Griffin Ministries in um, in near in Pitt County, North Carolina. And uh, last year we went and built a home in Winterville. We had a great experience with our building project and also with interacting and ministering to the community. And so we have voted as a congregation to go back there this year. Our project has, you know, adjusted and modified to the circumstances, but we're still committed to building a home for a needy family. And we feel like this is one way that we can put action to our belief of ministering and being the hands and feet of Christ. Um, traditionally, almost everyone in the congregation has been involved in some way. Quite a few people go. If you go, we do stay in a motel uh, in Greenville. It is uh, Holiday Inn Express. The cost this year for people who stay will be $60 per night per room. If you stay with somebody else, of course, you divide up the cost. And our continental breakfast is included with that, so it's a pretty good deal. We serve food on site at lunchtime to all the workers. And the only expense you would have with meals is you do go out to eat and you uh, pay your own expenses for your dinner at night. It's a great time of fellowship. You get to, you know, have time with people that you may not ordinarily have time to to spend with. So it's not only a ministry and a mission, but it's almost like a retreat experience for me in terms of being able to interact and grow spiritually and in fellowship with other people in the congregation. So it has a lot of great attributes to the mission other than the fact that we're building this home. If you are interested in going, there's a sign-up sheet out in the, um, the hallway outside Smith Hall and you simply sign up for one night, two nights, the whole week, whatever you're able to do. There's usually a lot of coming and going through the week, so you can probably catch rides if you do need to, to uh, you know, only go for part of the week, or if your family has to do different schedules. Um, we will be going the week of July 4th, which has been our traditional time. We will leave, on, most of us will leave on Sunday afternoon, and be down there for Sunday night and start work on Monday morning. And then the plan, I think, is to try to come back on Friday afternoon if we have our, um, our mission accomplished. But as I said, you can, be, you can be flexible in your times. That's just our general schedule. Um, we're building the house for a woman who's 62 years old. She's a housekeeper. Uh, she has a, a daughter living with her and two grandsons. And so please be thinking about how you can be a part of this. One way is to pray. Pray for the people we're ministering to, the people in the community, 
those of us who are going and pray that all the logistics come together, that this will be a successful project. We need uh, financial contributions to help us pay for the, the building supplies. We provide, as a congregation, the funds to pay for all the building materials. And our goal is, 20, goal is $28,000. Uh, you can give in the treasure chest. You can, if you do online banking, you, you can you know, send your check that way. Note on your check or your envelope that it's for the home mission project. And we also collect furniture to help uh, provide uh, things for the home because people in our ministries usually do not have beds, mattresses, you know, chest of drawers, whatever, side tables, things that, that people would need for a family. So if you have anything like that, you could contact me or Barbie Kale, or if you let the church office know, they'll let one of us know. Uh, and, we, and we need to kind of know where we stand with that as soon as possible. So if you have any questions, catch me, catch Barbie Kale, Roger Jones, and we will do our best to, uh, to provide the answers. But this has been a project that our church has almost had an identity with for many years. And we hope we can continue to do so. So please pray for the project and pray for how you might be involved. Thank you. may be thinking that sounds like a really amazing project man i wish i knew how to do some of that work um we love people that have lots of skill in the area of construction and other things but we take a lot of people that really aren't as skilled in that and it's amazing there is a job for everyone so i will say if you're thinking about it but you're not really sure how you can help they can find a place for you we can find a place for you it'll it'll work um if you are a visitor and you have not before had one of our visitor packets, you will find them closest to the door there on the table, and you will find in that visitor packet a mug and a tasty, tasty drink and some information about the church, and we would love um, for you to have some information about us. We would love if you would like to sign up over there to have some information so we can include you on some of our uh, mail outs and social media so you know exactly what's going on um, here at College Park. We are glad you are here this morning. And I said a few minutes ago, God is in this place. And uh, I don't know what your week has been like. I don't know if you come into this place and you are coming just ready to worship and ready to know him and feel him and, and, and know his presence. Or whether you're coming in weighted down with a week full of everything you can possibly imagine. But no matter which way you're coming from this morning, he is here. And he wants to commune with you. He wants to speak to you. He wants you to hear his voice. He wants to hear your praises. And so we are going to stand together. We're going to sing glory to God forever.
I invite you to pretend with me that we have already renovated Smith Hall. Okay? And the stage is right there where Cecilia's Cafe is now. Yes. And I had a hand for Cecilia's Cafe. Yes. All the faithful work. And Cecilia's Cafe has moved into here. And the stage is there. And the lighting is all focused in on the stage. It's really kind of a cool environment. And standing right in the middle of the stage, we find Jesus. That would be cool too, wouldn't it? <laughs> Pardon? Well, I, I don't know if I have to wait for the renovation or not. <laughs> well, let's just say after the renovation is done, we find Jesus standing there center stage, and he has this, this bright light focused in on him. Bright light. And it's focused there, and, and, and the, the, the light is spilling out into the rows. And, and we have all these rows of people, and the house is full. And, and, and in the house, we, we find all kinds of people. We find there's John, the beloved disciple. That'd be cool, too, wouldn't you? <laughs> we have John, the beloved disciple, and Fred Jenkins, who runs the BP station and builds habitat houses. These are all fictitious names, except the disciples, by the way, just so you're trying to figure out who Fred Jenkins is, okay? All right. And, and we have Peter, the fisherman, the brash woman, the one that always spoke out. And we have Jennifer, who works with autistic children. Then we would have Mary Magdalene. And we'd have the man who works at the library and sings in the choir, somewhat off-key, but yet he makes a joyful noise. He sings in the choir. We have Betsy, who teaches third graders in Sunday school there, as well as that quiet man. A quiet man that sits at the back of, of, of the, the seating and, and is always kind of keep to himself no matter who tries to engage him. We have all of those. We have all of those people that are there. And, and in, light, in, in other words, we have all these people who are gathered. Jesus is in the light. But these people that are all gathered here, including yourself and myself, we're gathered here. And the light is kind of spilling out onto us. And, and in a certain sense, we're all kind of frightened and tentative. We are saints, but we're also sinners. We're believers sometimes who struggle to believe. We're sometimes betrayers who seek mercy, get up in the morning, and with God's grace, we do the best that we can. And beyond us, beyond the shadows of this vast building here, in the back door comes a gentleman, and he walks to the front, and guess who's on the stage? This is Nicodemus. Nicodemus, and he has come to see Jesus. He stands there blinking in the light, as I am doing now, and shielding his eyes to where he can kind of see out, to see people, see who's here. And, and we discover, we know somewhat intuitively that this is Nicodemus. He is the leader of the Jews. He is uh, a well-known character in the Bible. We recognize his face, but, but we also see in him something else. We see in Nicodemus a person from our past long ago who every time we spoke of our faith kind of shook their heads sadly and wondered if we were getting carried overboard by this whole religious thing. We see in Nicodemus the skeptical neighbor who has no use for organized religion. We see in Nicodemus a guy at work or a gal at work who smiles and kind of chuckles to themselves about the backwardness of people who pray in times of trouble. We see in Nicodemus maybe the roommate that we had in college who wondered how anybody could possibly believe all that religion. And we see in Rick Nicodemus the voice inside of all of us that sometimes wonder if faith is just an illusion. We see all of these things. But you see, Nicodemus has the savvy to recognize that Jesus is up to something quite extraordinary. That faith has a mysterious power, but he comes as an inquisitor to put the faithful to the test. And, and the, the biblical account, mine is extra biblical in case you haven't picked up on that. This really hasn't happened yet. It would be cool if it does, but the biblical account is recorded in John chapter 3. 
And normally we have scripture up here for you to look at, but today I want you not to look around. Actually, I want you to close your eyes, and I want you to put yourself in the story. I'm not going to ask you which person you are in the story, but I want you to literally put yourself in the story and, and let it unfold in your mind as I read it to you. So close your eyes and hear this story. Now, there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a member of the Jewish ruling council, and he came to Jesus at night and said, Rabbi, we know you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one could perform the miraculous signs that you were doing if God were not with him. In reply, Jesus declared, I tell you the truth, no one can see the kingdom of God unless he's born again. How can a man be born when he is old? Nicodemus asked. Surely he cannot enter a second time into his mother's womb to be born. Jesus answered, I tell you the truth. No one can enter the kingdom of God unless he is born of water and the spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the spirit gives birth to spirit. You should not be surprised at my saying you must be born again. The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it is going. So it is with everyone born of the spirit. How can this be? Nicodemus asked. You are Israel's teacher, said Jesus, and you do not understand these things? I tell you the truth. We speak of what we know and we testify to what we have seen, but still you people do not accept our testimony. I have spoken to you of earthly things if you do not believe. How then will you believe if I speak of heavenly things? No one has ever gone into heaven except the one who came from heaven, the Son of Man. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the desert, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already. Because he has not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. This is the verdict. Light has come into the world. But men love darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light. And will not come into the light for fear that his deeds will be exposed. But whoever lives by the truth comes into the light. So that it may be seen plainly for what he has done has been done through God. Nicodemus said, Rabbi, <coughs> Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God. We, catch that? We know that you are a teacher. Nicodemus speaks for a group. That, who does he represent? Well, maybe the Pharisees. And that's a reasonable assumption. Maybe the group of those who had been impressed by Jesus' signs and wonders, the miracles, things he'd done. Yeah, maybe, maybe them too. Maybe who he was speaking for. But Nicodemus also represents, I think, a larger group than just the Pharisees or just those who had observed all the miracles. He represents all those who, in John's terms, belong to the world. Verse 14, Jesus talks about those who belong to the world. And I think Nicodemus is a good representative. He's a symbol of all of humanity who are standing there in the shadows, who are attracted by and at the same time threatened by Jesus, all at the same time. You know, those people who, who recognize something extraordinary in Jesus, but yet they I don't quite believe yet. Yeah, he does some really cool things, but I you know, kind of like a moth that's attracted to the, the candle. And, and, and Nicodemus has come in the back door and he's been attracted to the light. But he's still a creature of the night. He came by night. He didn't want to be seen in the public eye. And he says, we know that you're a teacher. <laughs> that was kind of a brownie. <laughs> Thank you, brownie points there. Ah, we know you're a teacher. We know you do some really good things. And he said, ah, we know that you're a teacher who's come from God. He even granted in that, but even in him saying that, there's kind of this implied barb challenge here, kind of a, a hidden note of sarcasm. It's kind of like, how can you be a 
a teacher from God. You don't have the right credentials. You haven't been to seminary. <laughs> How can you possibly be a teacher from God? In short, he's saying, come on, where do you, where do you get all that, really? Where do you get that power? Where do you get that knowledge? Where, where's it coming from? And, and those gathered around the stage here, including us, you know, as we're sitting out here, we, we probably have, have heard that question, too. We probably heard that from someone somewhere that our culture, our culture that is always trying to take religious experience and break it down into something less than mystery. They want to break it down to something they can manage, something they can understand, something they can control. You know, our culture observes people praying. They see us on mission trips. They see us serving. They see us thanking God and praising God. But then they're persuaded, you know, they, they think, they think really what all that comes down to is it's about self-fulfillment or, or greed or deception or, or habit or parental control or neurosis or the opiate of the people. You know, that, that's what they think. You know? and, and Jesus' reply to their objection would garner an amen from us, hopefully. You know, Jesus said it's not a matter. It's not a matter of self-fulfillment. It's not a matter of status. It's not a matter of greed or neurosis or control or anything having to do with earthly terms. Jesus says it comes, it comes from above. It's not about earth. It's about spirit. It's about heaven. In order to understand life in the spirit, Jesus says you must experience that life. In order to understand spirit, you must walk in the spirit. He told him, he says, you must be born again. You must be born from above. In modern terms, you just had to be there. <laughs> you have to be there to get it. But Nicodemus, you know, he, he's struggling. He's holding on to his categories. He's trying to make what Jesus is saying make sense in world's terms. Right, then he said, okay, so are, are you supposed to crawl fully grown back into your mother's womb? That's a little strange. And, and, and the challenge is really not just to Jesus, but also to his followers, us that are seated here. You know? Every day we hear the voice of Nicodemus. You know, friends, associates, family. We hear the voice of Nicodemus saying, you know, you claim that your life has been changed. Yeah, right. You, you, you claim that you've been born and you, right, sure, leper can't change, it's fine. So you hear those things. You're, you're really just the same old person. You just got a little piety lather on. We hear that. And, and in short, the experience of the spirit claims our culture is really just a complicated religious way of talking about ordinary experiences with just another label attached to it. It could better be described, they would say, in psychological or sociological terms without all the theological fog. <laughs> one, one of my favorite stories is about a, a pretty salty, uh, <laughs> edgy, radical uh, Baptist preacher. I know you find it hard to believe. But, but his name was Will Campbell, a remarkable man. And, and the story goes that he was attending the trial of, of a KKK Klansman who was accused of murdering an African-American man. There was a reporter who was covering the trial, and he honed in. Once he found out that guy was a Baptist preacher, he zeroed on in on him. I'm going to watch this guy. I'm going to watch him all the way through this trial. I'm going to get some good stuff. And he watched Will Campbell all the way through this, and he was astounded to see that Campbell would, would meet and minister to the family of the Klansmen. That he would meet and minister to the family of the man who was murdered. And the reporter was quite baffled by all of that. Like Nicodemus, he said, how can this be? How can you do this? How can you be associated with both parties in this thing? You've got to choose sides. And he kept badgering Campbell with that. How can you do this? How can you possibly be on positive terms with both an accused racist murderer and the victim's family? Well, Campbell's standard answer was just mutter something about everybody being a human being. He was going to minister to everyone. That did not satisfy the reporter, as Selwyn does, by the way. It did not satisfy the reporter. 
And he, he, he pinned him up against the wall, figuratively speaking, and said, this is just not logical. You can't possibly care for both the clansman and the victim. Whose side are you on? Why in the world do you think you can do that? At this point, Campbell had pretty much had enough. So the public record says that he looked at the guy and says, because I'm a bleak, 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 bleak Christian. Expedition deleted this morning. I imagine that got some people's attention. His testimony was, this is who I am with all of my faults and with all of my, but this is who I am. Using the framework of how the world is supposed to operate, the reporter could not account for the reconciliation that comes from another plane, a, a possibility for a human interaction that's born of the spirit. He just didn't get it. Nicodemus just couldn't get it. Back and forth, Nicodemus and Jesus go. And they continue to speak out of different frames of reference. Jesus is speaking of spirit, but Nicodemus is speaking of flesh. The world cannot comprehend what's happened to the followers of Jesus. They just don't get it. And they say, what's happened to you? How can, you, how can we justify this strange behavior in you? Why do you no longer believe like the rest of us? Why don't you believe like your mommy and daddy did? What's wrong with you, boy? And in, and in many ways, the climatic statement comes when Jesus says in verse 11, we speak of what we know and we testify to what we have seen. That's what it comes down to. Concerning faith, I'm not sure there's any better statement than that. We speak of what we know and we testify to what we have seen. For the first century church, for John, for John and Peter, and, and, and for those in the first century, their experience of Jesus in the Spirit was their only defense. In arguments with the religious establishment, these early Christians, they didn't have airtight philosophical theories or theological arguments, any of that for the rightness of their doctrine. They just simply spoke of what they knew and what they had seen, what they had experienced. Think about the Samaritan woman. She just said what she had experienced in John chapter 4. That's all she could say. What about the man that had been born blind in John chapter 9? He just told what happened. He told what he had experienced. So what about Fred Jenkins from the BP station who, who builds for Habitat Humanity? What about Betsy who teaches Sunday school? What about the beloved disciples who, who fall on their knees at the side of an empty tomb? Why, why does Jennifer care for those autistic children? It's not because of some wrinkle in their psyche, and, it, and it, it's not because of ontological proofs for the existence of God. It is rather the fact because the Spirit has spoken to them. They know what they have experienced, and they share. Does the world get that? In the short run, no. Realistically, the, the experience of the Spirit can be a constant source of irritation and, and, to the world. Jesus explained it. He said in verse 19, The light is coming to the world, and people loved darkness rather than light. He goes on to explain why. Because their deeds are evil, and light exposes. Beginning in the book of John, the writer of John makes it pretty clear. He says, the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not overcome it. That's the final story. You want proof? Proof's in your life. The proof was in Nicodemus' life, because later in the story as it unfolds, later in the Gospel of John, guess who shows up as a follower of the new? A disciple of the light. Guess who shows up? Our man Nicodemus. And he would say, how can this be? How can this be? Surely someone must have asked him that. And with a shrug of his shoulders, he probably replied, I can only speak of what I know and testify to what I've seen. I pray that would be our story. This morning, I pray that that is your story. We're going to observe communion together. We're going to take communion. It's a time to celebrate life in the Spirit. It's a time to celebrate the resurrected Christ in our lives. And as we break the bread, share it, we dip it into the cup, 
I want you to reflect on just how much grace God has extended in your own life. Remember the experiences that you've had with him and give thanks for them. For those of you that are here with us for the first time or haven't shared communion with us, let me tell you this. As, as a body of believers, we practice open communion, which means if you're a believer, we, we want you to participate. We welcome you to participate. We do a little bit differently in here than we do in big church. <laughs> what, what we do here, over here you'll find three stations. You can go to any one of them. They're all the same. Uh, you'll find a loaf of bread in there. You just pinch off a piece of bread from the loaf, dip it into the cup, and take it right there. There's no hurry. This is a time for communion, not only with God, but with your fellow believers. So as you go, you don't have to be real quiet or anything like that. You can visit with one another. Go to take communion together and have communion with God. We invite you to go now and take in any of the three stations. Mountain shake. 